Good evening. Tonight I have here with me in the studio a person who may be familiar to many of my regular listeners. He is Amos Vogel, the executive secretary of America's largest film society, Cinema 16. And he's here to discuss with us some of the problems of bringing films considered unavailable to New York audiences. Mr. Vogel, who is with me here at the table tonight, is a person who is very familiar with bringing films from abroad and from sources not usually considered normal in the film business. And I would like to start out by asking him to give us possibly a, a very short rundown, sort of as a background, of the method normally used by commercial people who run theaters for bringing in films, so that later on we can see in juxtaposition what the problems are that are faced by a non-commercial person interested in out-of-the-ordinary film. Well, uh, the way the commercial distributors obtain their films, of course, is by going directly to the sources, wherever they may be, primarily in Europe, and making some kind of commercial deal on a particular film, which then is sent to America, and uh, then the distributor here attempts to sell the film to a theater. Uh, this is a very costly procedure, not only because of the uh, expenses of transportation and importation and what have you, but of course primarily because it's a commercial deal and a commercial sale of the film has to be made with the original source in Europe or wherever it may be. And the prices vary, of course. They vary depending tremendously. On, depending on what? Well, this is a very uh, important point. Uh, depending, I would say, not necessarily or not primarily on the artistic value of the film, but on its sellability in the American market. The box office criterion, of course, is the main criterion for the commercial importers of films. And uh, this, uh, incidentally, is, of course, the difference between what we are attempting to do and what the theaters have to do since they are organized on the basis of uh, selling the largest number of tickets. Let me understand you exactly. You mean that the, the, the owner of the film in Europe only gets paid after the box office returns are in? No. In many cases he gets paid in advance, or rather in all cases he gets paid in advance, on different bases, either on, in terms of a, an advance guarantee or in terms of the American distributor buying the film outright for anywhere from, say, $5,000 to, uh, fi uh, to $500,000, or, you know, depending on the value, running time... Or the expected value. ...of the film. That's right, yes. In other words, if a Bardot film is uh, bought by Ed Kingsley, he's perhaps likely to pay $100,000, whereas a film like Naked Night by Ingmar Bergman that nobody had heard of before it came can probably be bought or something like uh, five or ten thousand dollars. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the value uh, of any given director in box office terms rises. I mean, it's it may have been possible to buy the the uh, Bergman films initially for very little money, but I'm sure that as he becomes more popular here at the box office, they will become much more expensive. You know, I would like to do one little thing, which is extraneous to the show, but I would like to mention it because. On September the 16th, this coming week, The Naked Night is going to be screened at the Thalia Theatre. And this is one of my favorite films. I think it's certainly the best film that Bergman has made. And last week in the New York Times, it was dismissed with such an underhanded statement that I just cannot let it go. I want to recommend wholeheartedly to everyone who is interested in Bergman to go and see The Naked Night this coming September 16th at the Thalia to throw the whole Bergmanian opus into proper perspective. That's all right. <laughs> Sideline. Well, then if the if it's the problem of buying the films that are expected to make the most money, does that mean that a film society has to or a, a group of people who are not commercial has to compete in the commercial market for those films? No. Well, first of all, let me explain this. Uh, most film societies in America uh, are not large enough, let us say, to go directly to sources abroad. What these film societies do is to obtain films from existing American distributors of these films and to then, you know, they rent them and show them. However, uh, at Cinema 16, uh, I found over the years, more and more, I must say, 
that a very large number of very good films never come here and are never taken by American distributors precisely because in, in some respect they are not, let us say, box office or they do not fit into a specific slot as far as the educational film libraries are concerned, you know. For example, it is easier to sell a mediocre film on uh, how to make a woodcut, let us say, than it is to, sh to sell a good European art or independent or experimental or scientific film if it does not fit into any particular category that can be used by schools. What well, actually, what you're saying is uh, a pretty drastic thing, namely that the entire film audience and the whole country depends on the whim or the arbitration of a handful of people who are the distributors. Yes. And upon their decisions... Uh, As to what will to sell, yes. Order, yes. You know, to just... Yes. The, the whole... Uh, Let's say that anybody who's really interested in, in getting a picture, a perspective of what goes on in the world of film, cannot do so practically except by going to Europe and seeing for himself the things that are being made all over in other countries. Yes. And if he doesn't want to depend only on the judgment. That's of the correct. Standards. Yes. Uh, this is, uh, uh, there's a very ex simple explanation for this. It is simply that uh, the movies and the film industry, just as any other industry, uh, is based on profit and loss. And it is, it's really a business. It has nothing to do with art. It, is, it may be incidentally connected with art, and if art is sellable, so much the better. But actually, it has to be looked at as any other business, and, you know, the businessman wants to stay in, in business and wants to make more money. Now, it is also true that, of course, many very good films make, do make money, and it's also true that many of these uh, American distributors including, for example, Kingsley, who you mentioned before, will buy films not necessarily based on the box office returns, but from time to time will take a film only of artistic merit, let us say, uh, with the losses being recouped by Bardot, yeah. let us say. You see? I think that was the case when he bought uh, Ordet by Dreyer. Yes, that would be an excellent example, yes. So that, you know, uh, I'm not in any way uh, attempting to, you know, impugn uh, their motives, let us say. I mean, you know, it's a simple matter of uh, operation and uh, uh, staying, you but know, in business. But I suppose that this is basically the, the root of this whole myth that some films are simply unavailable. You know, you go through yeah. life uh, or through your film life. Yes. Well, there's another Hearing aspect. about films you, you, you never have a chance to see, and something sort of grows up, some, some mythical entity of there being a, a large number of films unavailable, lost, yes. destroyed, you know, yes. never... Im yes. Now, there's another interesting aspect to this. You know, we concentrate in our own programs also very much on short films, which we feel are neglected by the commercial theaters, and which very often, since they are short and rather inexpensive to produce, which very often uh, can present interesting new advances in film art or in film experimentation. Now, as far as these shorts are concerned, the situation with uh, European films, European shorts, is such that on the one hand, the Americans do not know what films, what short films are available in Europe. They do not know or they're not interested in knowing because it's not profitable enough. And on the other hand, the Europeans, the European producers, have an, ex a, an entirely distorted notion of the size of the American market. So that in between the Europeans asking for tremendous amounts of money and the Americans uh, knowing that they can't afford it or not even knowing what films are being made, there's a very great gap, which means that films simply do not come here. And this includes... Uh, prize-winning shorts of all nations, you know, that have been shown at all international festivals. Now, what, what we have tried to do in the last few years is to bring these films here on the basis of, of uh, making available to them a showcase where they can be seen, not only by, let's say, uh, film lovers, but also by American distributors and American exhibitors mm -hmm. and television stations, who, as a result of seeing these films at Cinema 16, very often decide to buy them, you see? So that we have been able to get many of these films directly from Europe. So you serve a double function, not only of making them available to your members, 
but also of eventually making them available to the American market at large. Exactly. I think one of the reasons why shorts aren't imported as much as they ought to be is that there isn't really a place on the American double bill in the ordinary theater for a short, unless the, the program runs an odd number of minutes and they have to fill, and then there are things they can get for nothing from United Carbide or United right. Fruit, you know, little right. shorts about bananas. And uh, on the other hand, in Europe, where theaters are, or the motion picture industry is in many countries subsidized or partially subsidized, they have to show shorts. It's part of the rules, part of the law of exhibition, cultural film. And we don't have anything of that sort. That's right. And I think probably TV is, is the best outlet for that kind of material. Well, they really, uh, I, I don't really uh, agree, at least not as of this moment, in the sense that there is no slot for films of this sort, you know, where, say, a 10-minute film can be shown. And secondly, again, the demand of the TV medium for a mass audience, you know, immediately creates problems because... Um, you know, it's the, it's it's uh, there is an appeal, of course, in television. I'm, I don't think I'm giving away any secrets to what has been referred to as the lowest common denominator. Mm. And uh, however much all of us would like to change that, that is the situation at this point. You don't think that applies in film and motion pictures? Yes, to some extent, it certainly does in the commercial cinema. Yes, it's. I think it's really only the art theaters who, at least to some extent, have gotten away from that and have. Have you any idea how many art theaters there are in the country now? No, I do not. Uh, there are several hundred, of course. But the, the, the term is deceptive because in many places the art theater simply shows some of the more offbeat, let us say, American films. In that other places like they concentrate on, concentrate on sex films, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so it's, it's a very... It's not easy to really pin that down. You bring up a whole range of questions and you say that those films don't really appeal to sufficiently wide audience. In a sense, I would assume, from the time that I ran a film society myself, that was certainly true then, and I'm sure it's true of yours, that a film society fulfills not only the purpose of bringing to an audience the films that that audience wants to see because it has heard of them and hasn't been able to see them anywhere else, but also of well, I don't like the word education, yes. but in some sense, widening the horizon of yes. those people. So you can't really say that those films don't appeal to these people yes. who may not even be familiar with them. Thanks. I'm sure the same thing applies on television, yes. where we're constantly harangued by the, by the idea of mass communications and this won't go. Yes. And nobody ever tries as a result. Right. I'm sure that a lot of right. things would go very well right. if they were tried. I completely agree with you. I mean, I think I didn't make myself clear. Uh, if, uh, nothing in what I said before should indicate that I believe in the concept of an elite and uh, another group which is incapable of appreciating what the elite appreciates. Quite on the contrary, I think what is wrong with all mass communication media today, ra radio, television, films, is that the appeal that the appeal is only on one level and that the audience is not offered alternatives they should be and must be offered alternatives and if they are they obviously will either be either enjoy the alternative immediately or begin to appreciate and enjoy it as they see more and more of it now for example if we showed an experimental film on television today it would be laughed out of court because in a sense this audience is not prepared for it this does not mean that if they saw experimental films once a week on television that after one or two years of this they would not appreciate them the same way people do who let's say have been reading poetry for many years and appreciate it you see i think this conditioning is to a great extent a social phenomenon not as much one of getting used to different material People will laugh at something that somebody who sits next to them is laughing at. And uh, when you uh, imagine the average home with the Schlitz cans and mm -hmm. baseball game and so on, and then the baseball game com goes off and a Stanley Brackage film comes on, you know, suddenly that milieu jars you. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I can mm -hmm. just imagine that somebody starts to laugh in this room there with all the beer and everything. Yes. So naturally, immediately everyone laughs. Yes. Whereas if it was introduced 
in some other way yes. and put into a perspective properly. Yes. I think that there is some universal truth in the best of those films which could appeal to everyone. Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, one of the items on our program this year is a selection of films from British television which indicates their social documentaries and they indicate what our television could do and doesn't do. All these films consist of interviews with what might be described as the common man. For example, one of them is an interview with a sewer man and the locale is the sewer because this is where the man works and he talks about his work. And there are several such, you see. Now, there is a, a field which uh, is, is really, it's limitless in terms of what could be done with interviewing real people in real surroundings, talking about real problems, and thereby appealing to the equally real problems that the listening audience or viewing audience has. But very little of that is done, of course. We are confronted with artificial situations, let us put it charitably. See, now you, as we go on, you keep bringing up things which are all topics for shows by themselves, real, and the whole concept of that you know, the differentiation between motion pictures and television. There's mm -hmm. no real, no established aesthetic, but mm -hmm. I would presume that the word real, in as much as it pertains to what exists on the outside, should be more the province of television, whereas the directed reality, mm -hmm. the fantasy, mm -hmm. the uh, reality of the mind, perhaps, is more something that motion pictures are more suitable for. I don't think that those things have been explored sufficiently, but we do make mistakes all the time in assuming that TV and movie and motion picture theaters are simply different methods of bringing things to an audience. Basically, they're different media, you know, that's very often yes. overlooked. Yes. But to get back to the film society idea, how do these myths evolve. How does a person know that there is a film called The Criminal Life of Archibaldo de la Cruz that he has never seen and that he knows he wants to see? And I know I've wanted to see for a long time and you have it on your program for this season. I mean, how do these things get abroad? Well, uh, first, of course, the people who, uh, such as myself, who attempt to bring such films to the attention of wider audiences, study the international film press. I have contacts, you know, in several countries who will tell me about films or write to me about films. Very often films are sent to me without my even having asked for them. And then, uh, in terms of my audiences, of course it's a matter of uh, their reading about films of this sort in books or magazines, and then my publicizing these programs to them so that they will become, so that they will know uh, that such titles exist. I mean, for example, on this season's programs, there are a large number of titles, uh, this season's Cinema 16 program, there are a large number of titles that uh, are not even known as yet in America. They happen to be films that won awards at one or several film festivals. They happen to be films that have been written about widely in the international film press, but so far they're not known here. Well, that's exactly the function we try to serve, to make them known here. And how do you how does your activity extend beyond New York City? In the sense that uh, first of all, through our mailing list, uh, we have a great many out of town people who get our programs, including institutions of various sorts, museums and what have you, who thereby hear about these films and then ask us where they can be obtained, and also directly by a distribution setup which we have, uh, which covers now. Uh, most of the America, most of the states here. I mean, you yourself are one of those arbitrary guys who keep films from us. Well, uh, I myself, I hap you see, it happens to be that in this in this case, I am only concentrating on experimental modern art and uh, films of that type, in which, from the very beginning, the profit motive cannot enter. Uh, the reason being that they are so uh, specialized in nature that, uh, you know, they're only taken by certain groups, uh, non-commercial groups, non-profit groups, schools, art museums, civic groups, 
churches, labor unions, you know, that kind of thing. Can anybody rent films from you? Yes. You mean a private person listening to this program? Yes. Who has seen any of the films that you show can yes. come to your office yes. and say, I would like We to have a great them. many people here and in other states who rent films for their own home use. What is an average rental of a of a ten minute experimental film? Well, that may run anywhere from three dollars to seven dollars for a ten minute film. For a one time showing. That's correct. That's very reasonable. Well, I wish it could be less, but uh, the costs are very high. You don't uh, handle features. No, we do not. There are a great many excellent distributors in town who do. And also, incidentally, in the 60 millimeter market, uh, many of these distributors are able to concentrate on classics of the cinema, you know, for example, say, contemporary films, United World, Bran, you know. Who do handle 16 millimeter features? Yes. Can yes. anybody rent those from them? Yes, definitely. And what's an average rental for a feature? That varies too. It varies anywhere from $12.50 to uh, $75 or $100. For a one time? On, yes, uh, but the average is less than that. In fact, the average is probably around $25, $50 perhaps. You have a list of the films that you rent? Yes. So anybody who's listening now who's interested could obtain a Definitely. list from you? Definitely, sure. At your address? Very happy to send, to send it to them. Your address. 175 Lexington Avenue, New, New York. York 16. And that's also where they can get the... The announcement for our forthcoming season, you know, listing the programs and no, membership rates. I've looked rate. at that. I've looked at that. I have it in front of me, and there are a lot of films. Usually, some of the pro you know, your programs I've looked at, and I've known of most of the films if I hadn't seen them before. But this program is full of films I've never even heard of. And I think that your, if this is really your function of bringing unknown things to these audiences, to us, then you're certainly fulfilling that bill very well. I mean. Some of the things here I've heard of, like The Last Day of Summer, is one of those Polish experimental films that I've heard a lot about and have yes, read that's very part of a criticism of. Yes, that won the Grand Prix at Venice, and it's part of a three-program festival of Polish films, which we're presenting this season by special arrangement, incidentally, with the Polish uh, state film company. We had to go directly to Poland and pay for the importation and exportation of all these films. Because again, some of them, even though they are excellent as films and as works of art, are not considered commercial enough to be shown in theaters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, one of them is, and they're fascinating films, one of them is Eva Wants to Sleep, which is a social satire, feature length from Poland, which satirizes uh, planning, uh, bureaucracy, law and order, and it's the kind of film you would not expect to... Uh, to have from Poland, but uh, on the other hand, it indicates the range of their production mm. over there. Do you get these uh, experimental things from many different countries? Or yes, there some from all over. For example, we have one very interesting film from India on our program this year called Kajurajo, which is a an exploration of a 12th century uh, of the 12th century capital of the Hindu gods. It's a place in central India where there are about 85 temples with the most magnificent artworks you can possibly imagine. And what is very interesting about the film is that it shows a religion which of course is very, very different from our Western style of religion. For example, the gods are humanized and sex is deified, mm -hmm. which is rather different from... Uh, our concepts of the good life. You know, one thing I want to mention about your program before the show is over. You have a program on November the 11th called The Cinema of Improvisation, where you show Shadows by John Cassavetes and Pull My Daisy by Robert Frank and Alfred Leslie. And uh, it seems to me that here you're fulfilling an even more important role, that of making films made in this country and which have had no distribution because of one reason or another available. I've myself seen Shadows, and I've had Casavitas on the show talking about it. It's a very, extremely exciting film, excellent, by far the best thing out of American cinema in a long time, which apparently has had no success in finding local, domestic distribution. Mm -hmm. Well, you see, there are hopes that, especially by virtue of this type of uh, prestige preview, you know, as we hold at Cinema 16, 
that uh, shadows and other films of this type will go into theatrical distribution and we certainly hope they do and uh, the example you gave of shadows and pull my days is, is a very important one because that's also part of our function to take an, an indigenous product let us say hmm. and to attempt to get it into commercial distribution uh, both these films are interesting not only because they're really in a sense improvised which is not true of Hollywood films of course which are very carefully planned and thereby very often become lifeless uh, not only are they improvised but they also deal with what might be called the beat generation although not facetiously but as a contemporary social problem worth thinking about well we're going to have a program here two weeks from tonight where we'll be discussing the philosophy of the beat cinema and the cinema of improvisation and the guest will be Jonas Mikas, the film critic of The Village Voice. So I don't want to spend any time on that now. But I know that there are a lot of films that are being made all the time by people who are not even familiar with the fact that there is such a thing as a distributor. I know that in universities and film groups everywhere films are being made all the time which never see the light of day of an audience. And how do you keep in touch with people like that? Do they hear of you and write to you? Both. You know, they write to me or I write to them. And you're quite right in what you said. For example, one of the prize-winning films on this year's program of uh, Creative Film Foundation award winners is a film made at the University of South California, uh, South Southern California, uh, under the rather impressive title "Have I Told You Lately That I Love You," <laughs> which uh, is a an indictment, you might say, of the contemporary gadget-oriented civilization and the fact that all human relations are being lost sight of in a mechanized society such as ours. Well, I hope that nobody will lose sight of the fact that there are films to be seen at Cinema 16 that aren't to be seen anywhere else. And Ms. Vogel, I would like to thank you for being with us this evening.